Welcome to the Exponential Era webcast. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Marcus Kirsch. Marcus is the founder and author of The Wicked Company, which is the name of his consulting firm as well as the title of his book. Marcus, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me, David Michael. So let's, uh, I'm going to kick off by asking you to please um, tell us a little bit about your background and then tell us what inspired you to write The Wicked Company. Yeah, so uh, my background is both in design and technology, where I originally started. And um, I work for various different industries, so it's a quite an eclectic mix of how essentially uh, my work's based around human-centered design. I think sort of when you look at like guys like IDEO, that's sort of my background in terms of education. Okay. And so I grew up through the dot-com boom and worked on a lot of early websites, and these kind of things. And over that path, got into innovation. And uh, essentially, over the years, I moved more from working and on innovation projects to building innovation contexts for teams to be able to do that kind of work. And that's what I still do. So I consult companies in building up these kind of environments, teams, departments, uh, for people to have the right mindset in order to do innovation, service design, those kind of things. And the book came along from, oh, probably the thought started about 10 years ago, and uh, I wrote it over the last two years. It came out last December. But I always had this kind of itch in the back of my head around a different kind of narrative because everyone's kept talking about technology. We're still talking a lot about technology, even in startups, when you look at like fintech and uh, insure tech and everything's still called tech. However, I found that the bigger differentiator is normally when you look at people's behavior and what they do, which is a much more complex subject matter if you look at the problem space. And so I got eventually all the way around back over, let's say 20 years to, to look at wicked problems again and tried to bring that concept to a wider audience with the book. And that's essentially what I've been trying to do. It's really interesting that you, uh, you, you know, you go down the behavior path. In uh, 2005, I wrote a book called The New Business Normal, and in it, we uh, explored the idea and came up with kind of a, an axiom that I'd been using for a long time, which was that performance is the residual of behaviors, meaning, you know, you get the behaviors right, you get the performance. If you focus on the performance, the variable becomes the behaviors. Problematic. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, I think, how did you, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of us, I think, you know, that understood that, you know, leadership's about influence. And if you want to get high performing teams, it's about influencing their behaviors. We all come to it, you know, different ways. Uh, mine was after chasing Moore's law for, you know, decades yeah. and figuring out you really had to have electrified teams or they wouldn't keep up um, and figuring out how to motivate them. So what, what were sort of the key ingredients that you found that led you to that, you know, similar conclusion? So I think it was uh, probably looking at the fact that um, when I did my MA over at Royal College, which was heavily influenced by the whole IDEO methodology, you saw that behavior drives adoption of technology. So technology didn't become the solution. It became an enabler for a potential solution. So that was an inherently different approach. Uh, there and it um, you could see how that reflects and responds actually with people so a lot of people who came out of that course who were talking at uh, conferences you could see that people even without a technology background would get it they would get the emotional connection so the emotional connection that's often part of behavior mm. is is a big value and the emotional connection you can then see reflect when I started touring through different industries so you look at advertising, the strongest brands are the ones that you make the emotional connections to. And when you look at teams, the way you energize them and make them excited about working on a big idea, that's all emotionally driven. It has nothing to do with what kind of tools they're using. Uh, more later studies now, when you look at uh, uh, um, Google's big research around best performing teams, same thing. It's not about the tools or how smart people are. It's about the, the soft skills and the social norms, basically the dynamic, the emotional dynamics between teams are what matters. So you can see the same with startups. If an app or something emotionally connects with people, I, for example, I would say that one of the nicest things with Uber is not that you have one click to get it, but actually, you know, the name of your driver, there's some trust built here, you know, you can see where the car goes, 
I remember putting my mom in a car, driving her across London and I wasn't in the car, but I knew exactly where they were. This is kind of this distrust building that I think a lot of old companies have a little bit forgotten. They thought, oh, I'll just give you the product and that's it. And a lot of companies, when they try transformation, oh, we just buy Microsoft Office and then that's it. It never worked. If you really look at it in that way, it never worked. So, so then I got more curious about it and expanded from you know, my design methodologies to look at all the other things and everything that, have, that you have seen coming out since then. So you look at how wicked problems are solved, which is you know, the Stanford design thinking approach. Talk all about empathy, that's emotion. You look at some new practices like service design, which builds on that, all empathy. You look at um, uh, behavioral science. So the whole nudging idea, all about behavior, all about emotion. So, you know, it, it builds up. The tricky part is that this is all qualitative, right? And qualitative, we don't tend to measure, or it's really hard to measure because it's so complex. So, and that's the gap to bridge, to move a bit more from the quantified things into the qualified things. So I've seen it for a long, long time, and I started more and more trying to measure it because eventually what you want to do in an organization is you want to go to get to the bottom line somehow because otherwise there won't be an investment. That's the tricky part. The tricky part when you say leadership should enable. Okay, but how is that going to sell more units, right? you always end up a little bit there and i think that's the tricky gap of that narrative to get there yeah i mean that's that's excellent you know it's it's uh not so much what you tell people but how you make them feel right so that emotional aspect that connection everything about your product or service the way you make people feel is really what's going to determine your ability to to engage them and to connect with them so marcus um you know we are living in this new era that we call the exponential era. And part of the uh, characteristic of this new era is the fact that problems are quite complex. Um, and you know, this term wicked problem has been uh, mentioned in several books and several authors have talked about what the wicked problem is, but I'm not sure our audience really knows that term. So can you tell us a little bit about what a wicked problem is? Yeah, so um, wicked problems have a particular set of characteristics that are beyond what we often call complex or tame problems. So the easiest way to understand, I found, is when you say it's basically a moving target. So the thing is that while I'm working on something, the problem will change. And once I deploy my solution, the problem will change further. And that means I am in a constant context of uncertainty because I don't know where this is going to change towards. I don't know how much my solution will affect it. The good thing is once I know that that's the case, that's the behavior, that's the thing that's happening, I can start acting different, differently towards it. So that's sort of the only chance we have because um, if you understand that most of the problems we're dealing now with are wicked problems, you'll set yourself up a bit differently to de-risk things and to approach things. If, 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 if you never will ever know enough about a problem to find the ultimate solution, you will start approaching it differently. And I think it's interesting that, because the term comes back from 50s or 60s, based back from Horst Rittel over at Stanford. Um, they looked at architecture and urban planning, those big complex projects, and that's where they started to define that term. They said, you know, there's just so many pieces moving about. There's nowhere there's no way a normal engineering approach can actually find the right solution for that. So we have to find something else. And that's how design thinking was born a couple of years later, the same place over in Stanford. So it's a moving target. And uh, the key factor to overcome is that you need to understand that you can only do incremental uh, improvements. You'll never reach the final perfect uh, solution. And uh, that means you have to do continuous learning. And if you know that, that all really gives you a good idea about what the different approach to that would be. Yeah, years ago, there was a great uh, analogy that uh, strategies like uh, a potter's wheel with a piece of clay, mm -hmm. and it's continuous, right? And it, it yeah. shapes to meet the circumstances and the situation. When you, you know, are dealing with, with clients, as an example, what's the biggest resistance piece that you find other than all well, the way we've always done it, which is sort of the, <laughs> the yeah, first yeah. thing out of their mouths. But yeah, you know, what, what at the, either at the governance level or leadership level, what, what sort of resistance do you find and how do you, how do you get past that? It's kind of like, you know, I the data is out there on wearing masks, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I think it's normally that you are given the time to treat what they think they know as assumptions mm -hmm. and not saying like, oh no, we know what it is and therefore not like, no, give us at least a few weeks to reassess. And I think today this is more important than ever, right? So we're in the middle of COVID, people are working from home. So not just the working from home, but the, the way organizations are now looking at how they provide services and products and how customers now are starting to expect things to happen differently. We just had a major mindset shift. People who have never had to deal with the internet or online as much as they did suddenly had to and they're going to start thinking a lot what they're going to do in the future differently and they will it's yeah. going to be a large part so the market has changed drastically now um let's see how much sticks but that's a question so we have a new problem space and this new problem space means that all the old facts are gone so let's reassess that so reassessing uh, and treating most things as an assumption is normally the first lesson to look at and the good thing is if, if usually when I'm given a couple of weeks at an organization to do that, the insights that normally come back are essentially exactly those gold nuggets to come back and say, actually the problem you thought is the problem isn't the problem. Uh, so, so therefore the second thing is give me enough time for that. Because you, you will know that uh, what companies want is not just they want change, they want it tomorrow, right? right. So if I don't start producing a solution tomorrow, they go, why we're not building something right so that's sort of the second hurdle usually and, and that goes into time and people so give me time and uh people available i don't need as, as much money as you might think but actually time and people is normally the biggest hurdle you say if you give me time till then to have a look at this to see what's that to, that you see the initial value this brings that's normally when the penny drops and that's sort of for me as you say, as they say here you know the proofs in the pudding so basically you come back with some actual insights that show that additional value that helps usually to 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 give you the investment and time for the next step so that's how i try to do it most of the time absolutely so marcus um when we talk about wicked problems um what are the skills that um, you think are important for a team um that is trying to solve these types of problems you know we've been we've gone through a period of time where we've uh, moved towards specialization, right? We had some very well-defined problems, engineering types of problems, marketing types of problems, where you specialized in that particular domain and you solved for that problem. Now with a wicked problem where things are constantly moving and it's uncertain and we don't know where it's gonna go, what are the skills that you should be developing in order to be effective in that in that world? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So and that 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 includes already you already have a couple of different things in there. So let's start with um, you know specialist and engineering. So normally you could throw on 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 classic problems you can throw a couple of specialists and they will be able to deal with that. Um, these days. I think polymath, people who know a lot about different areas are probably more valuable for you. Not in all areas, of course, but more so to find the new opportunities and the new values, the new ways to grow and to solve things. Because they will look at this wider spectrum, lots of different parts to bring together. They will more likely see interdependencies between things. They will more likely be the ones that bring departments together and start breaking up the silos that just don't work for us. So people who think like that, they will be your future value to really move organizations into the future with their products and services. Yeah, so the, return of the, the return of the generalist is going to be an important step. Yeah, you know, the definitely is. To, and it, yeah, and there's, there's, a big, there's a big challenge there in terms of uh, what does it mean to roles and role descriptions? What does it mean to uh, hiring people? How can I find and identify those people? I mean, I've been struggling for a good 20 years to often find particular roles like that because I'm all over the place in terms of my background. Uh, but I, normally what helps me, me is just to go in, have someone tell me a bit what the problem is, and then I point out the kind of two, three things I would do. But you don't always get that opportunity. You know, you don't always get that conversation. For a lot of particular roles, and that's what organizations do, they hire for the roles. Uh, and I think that's probably why in recent years we might have seen more and more CVs or, or job descriptions just have everything in it. And then when you arrive there, you do one thing because the companies themselves don't know what they actually need. Uh, they've been talking about T-shaped people for a long time, but they, I don't think they really know how to hire them. So that's one thing. Uh, in terms of uh, skill sets, 
the, the overarching skill sets that I believe are, you can train anyone very quickly, you can basically learn by doing, which is uh, something we, for example, did over at uh, BT, and we trained within a year, 14 teams, within within um, five months, we had three pilots with three teams, so and they were all non-designers, they were all pretty much developers and some project managers. Um, you can train them into sort of initial, fairly baseline um, human-centered research. And that's basically investigating a problem. Okay. Those things are not really hard to train. A lot of it is sort of common sense, but we know that as consultants, a lot of things we're hired for is to bring a, to, to, to be asked for the common sense aspect of things. Yeah. But you know, uh, that's what we do. Um, however, that, that's good for adoption rate, right? That means you can actually go, I, I, I would be confident enough, and I've been in doing probably like you guys, lots of workshops, go into a room, tell people about how this stuff works, you know, anything from writing a problem statement to uh, having a look at what are the assumptions, take the assumptions, turn it into a bit of a survey or at the base to some interviews, see what insights come back and line it back up with the business strategy and you're pretty much there, right? It's not the hot, toughest thing in the world. You need to guide people, of course, but you know, you can get, you can get a team there in a few weeks time. Mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, given that the gap between what organizations are doing today and what they should be doing, is so big, I think the low hanging fruit you can reach with that level fairly quickly. It gets trickier when you dig further down into more detail or you know, depending how you want to pivot these kind of things. But I think in general, uh, it's those kind of skills, problem solving skills, problem identifying skills, and a bit of dot research that you can teach anyone fairly quickly. And sometimes it's just about just telling people how to ask open-ended questions rather than yes or no questions, these kind of things. Uh, I think you can do that fairly quickly. So, but those are the skills really to be able to look at reality, the real reality and go, what's really going on? Uh, how do you connect to the people you're actually building things for? The other interesting thing is, you know, we talk uh, a lot about the convergence of technologies uh, and how that changes, it, you know, it creates a situation where you get a new ecosystem um, out of those convergences and that, you know, tends to be very disruptive. The other part though is when you're assembling teams to try and become disruptive in your own right, um, an often overlooked thing, and, and, and I think it deals with the wicked problem issue. The wicked problems are typically complex. They're, they're not simple, they're multidiscipline. In a multidiscipline mode, that means you gotta bring more people to the table. That also means the leadership of that multidiscipline activity has to have range. It has to have the ability to uh, see through, yes. or where do you go with that? Yes and no. Um, so I worked for at least six, seven different industries, I think from healthcare, entertainment, to automotive, to whatever. So I'm, I'm constantly learning. Um, in terms of leadership, I found maybe the best example yet again is that big BT project we did over the Da Vinci project, which is a massive transformation project for BTIT. Uh, building lots of teams, bringing methodologies to up to 4,000 people. Um, there, because I was part of the leadership there, I could actually quite step back. I didn't have to have the answers. I didn't have to know all the details and the tech that needed to be used to solve these things. That was what the teams could do. And the teams would find, so in terms of BT, it's a massive organization. They have specialists all over the place. They don't, you don't always need them. You actually, when you get closer to the solution, you go, oh, hang on a sec, let's check with this person, this person, and see what the best way forward would be, what our capabilities, what's the tech to buy. Um, you bring them in at various different points. Um, so they don't have to necessarily be part of the team. You sort of dock them, dock them on and off. Sometimes they represent partners, so you talk to partners about it. Sometimes you literally go and Google around. So when I was working in advertising, we did a lot. Even so, I was doing a lot of creative tech there. So it was quite, you know, I used to be a coder. I used to look at three different pieces of new tech every week. But even that didn't prepare me for all the stuff that's out there. So what do you do? Well, you go and you call someone up over in, in Singapore in a university that you've seen online and they've done some new, you know, kind of smart image matching and mapping thing. And you go and you talk to them and say, do you have a prototype? I saw what this can do. Can you build it for me? And that's how these things work. So I think there's something that the managing director of BT said quite smartly. She said, you know, the future will be a lot, uh, will be in partnerships because a single organization cannot contain yeah, right, right. all that. Plus, because the role of specialist is probably changing. Again, you, you don't necessarily need to have them all in your organization all the time. 
because it's just not sustainable. Um, you just need to know who to ask, really. And I think uh, looking at problems, that skill set is a lot about asking questions. And the better you get at that, the better actually you realize your teams are going to build their own networks and they're going to help each other, other teams and their network and bring in that knowledge. So it's, it's that kind of thing because you can't accumulate all of that and have all the specialists like no one can. Yeah. So you keep nimble. It, it's a lean approach essentially to knowledge, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, you know, we developed um, our methodology, SPX, and we, we have done what we call convergence research, which is really looking at different domains, right? And then putting those ideas together in a very unique way. And, you know, we uh, obviously looked at uh, design thinking, we used uh, lean, uh, agile, right. all these things, they have some common components that you can put together in a very effective way to help companies become more innovative and to deal with, you know, these types of uh, wicked problems that we're talking about here. So Marcus, we have come to the end of our time frame here. Um, do you have any <laughs> final thoughts for um, our audience and also uh, tell them how they can get a hold of you to, to learn more about uh, the work that you do and, and the book? Yeah. So then they can find me on LinkedIn uh, and contact me there. I don't know if you put any uh, my email in the cliff notes, maybe something like that or that. Uh, and they can find the uh, book on Amazon. So it's The Wicked Company, as you stated. Um, I think as a last thought, yeah, it's, um, uh, I think, uh, don't be afraid to go out of your comfort zone is probably the thing, right? So the whole change thing, it, it, especially now it looks a bit overwhelming and it might be very scary because a lot of people lost their jobs and don't know, you know, some companies went down and how we're going to go. You know, I believe that even so we're also a bit scared of the whole AI and the robots taking even more jobs away. I believe actually some of the opposite will happen. You know, this, this human aspect, this behavior and emotional aspect is so complex that we can't build enough AI and, robot, and robots not to create more jobs for us. Because I think we understand this best and even we are struggling. So I think we need a lot of us to tackle the future. And I think that's, that's, that's sort of the way I like to look at it. So, and the good thing is a lot of these things are not too hard. They're not rocket science, you know? Uh, no one needs to learn rocket science or need to know the best of the code that is out there. It's actually more about understanding people. And I think that is, tends to be actually a quite enjoyable journey to find out more about these problems. And it is actually what we're doing every, every, every time in our life. You know, we're trying to figure out life all the time and life is a big, big problem. So uh, I think, you know, it's, it, I think it's an exciting, it's an exciting time we're living in. And uh, maybe that, that gives us a bit of hope, a bit of positivity there. And otherwise all these dire news. Yeah, I would agree with you. So uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us uh, on our webcast today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.